librarian in the Bank Street Library in the village. And uh, my dad was a guy like those guys over there, a Hasid. Um, and for some reason, the two of them couldn't make it. And so I went to South Carolina when I was two. And uh, somehow, when I was about three, all I wanted to do was be on horseback. And I, when the when the fruit sellers would come with their mules in their in their driveway and say watermelon, I got watermelon, I got sweet peaches. I would go up and I would shimmy up the leg, and then he would sort of take me up on top of the mule, and my mom would let me go <coughs> sitting on that mule with the fruit, and then. By the time I was four, I was riding. By the time I was in school, all I wanted was a pony. And there were three kids in school who rode their ponies to school. I would go to school and I would hide my shoes because not many people had shoes in school. Uh, this was a school where you stood the Dixie, where Lincoln <laughs> and Sherman were the kind of enemies that I understood Hitler to be. Um, and uh, this is how I grew up. Um, and at some point, my mother had a rooming house. I drew incessantly all over her cookbooks. Um, and then a man came to stay at our house because it was a kind of house where people, <clears throat> you know, came to the beach. Who was at the beach? So um, he was a sign painter. He'd been to art school, and he looked at my drawings and he said to me, "His name was Mr. Buddy." All I remember was Mr. Buddy, and I think Mr. Buddy and I became buddies. My mother told him not to come back anymore because she did, definitely did not want me to be an artist. And Mr. Buddy said, if you make five drawings a day in five years, you might be able to call yourself an artist. And so I took that seriously. I studied with a lot of people. Probably didn't get any better advice. I have been drawing most of my life. I, I had a couple of uncles in a neighboring town that had clothing stores. That's how we got to South Carolina. And I was supposed to go over there and learn how to be in business. And they would call up my mother and say, he can't sell anything. He can't wrap anything. He can't deal with people. He's a dreamer. I really feel sorry for you. He'll never amount to anything. And I'm afraid my mom took that seriously. Um, Maybe he's right. Maybe they were right. I don't know. It was a tough. It was a tough sell, and so I, I kind of retreated to animals. I got a job at the racetrack, uh, riding racehorses in the ocean. Um, we get up, I get up at five, four thirty, and I ride. And it was only I was the only other white exercise boy. The jockeys were white. But I was riding with um, with black kids who I didn't go to school with, but we had a great time. Um, and we'd be soaking wet, we'd change clothes, we'd sometimes feed watermelon to horses, and they'd go to school. Yeah, they'd go to their school, I'd go to my school. My mother, unlike her sisters and brothers, uh, I guess some people would call her a radical. Uh, she was outspoken about the civil rights movement um, and in 1954 um, when there was a hurricane in our town and our maids told my mother did you know that down on the ocean front there are houses there with many maids who are who are there and there the owners of the houses filled their cars with their possessions and left them there. And so my mom and I went and the maid we had and rounded them up and filled our house, which was, of course, you know, whatever. So the clan came and burned across in front of our house. And, um, you know, my mom was braver than I was. And um, she told them to get that goddamn thing out of our yard, and they did. Um, but that was the kind of life we had. I was, I was, uh, went to Pratt. I was only allowed to go to art school if I. I went to commercial art school, so I went to Pratt for one semester and kind of didn't fit. Everybody there said, you're not cut out to be a commercial artist, you should be a fine artist, which I knew. And so I went back to the University of South Carolina in pre-med, which was my, what my mom wanted. And the deal was, as long as you stayed in pre-med, you could go to the best art schools in the country um, every summer. 
So I went to the Art Students League, and then I studied with um, Morris Cantor. And Morris Cantor was a very tall man with a thick Yiddish accent and a tiny head. I was a short guy. Morris Cantor would talk about your art with his feet. He would say, well, you see this over here? And, and then at the end, he said, everything you do has a certain twist. <laughs> and so this twist thing is really in my work. There is some kind of twist. There, I don't fit with the academic artists. They don't like me because I am unpredictable, or my subject matter isn't what they were taught to do in art school. I, what I do, I don't know why I do what I do, but I wasn't taught to do it in art school. Initially, I had dreams of being, a, because of all those experiences I told you, a public artist. I, um, I went to Skowhegan to learn fresco. I really dreamed of being the Southern Jewish Diego Rivera. And uh, I don't know, ended up teaching, ended up having families, ended up having children, and uh, became an intimist, I guess, rather than, um, than a, a public artist. And so, you know, stuff evolves. Um, certain themes are obviously here, you now know. I mean, obviously, this is about love and about loss and about, um, and about animals and about um, all of those things. I knew nothing about my background. My mother said, you know, your father's a family is ultra-Orthodox. They're Hasidic. Um, they came from Brooklyn. They came from Hungary and they loved paprika, um, and people would say to me, hey boy, whose boy are you? And they really meant, not my, my mother, because they knew who my mother was, they meant that um, I was some kind of bastard. And um, when I wasn't, I mean, I grew up without a picture of my father. I never s saw him until one day when we came to New York when I was 11. Nora and I recently just went to find my roots in, um, in Budapest and in Vats, which is right outside of Budapest, where my family were grain dealers for, for 300 years. I saw the graves of my great-grandmother and great-grandfather. I saw the graves of my great-great-grandfather. My great-grandmother was born in another, died in another town. Um, and I saw all the sort of, in these memorials to my family, and we saw the where the business was and where the house was, and um, you know, it's all gone. It's all, all gone. The last Abelis died a couple months before we got there. So, um, in Hungary. But it was interesting. It's fascinating, and um, I guess you're always just trying to find where you where where, where you're grounded and, and um, who you are and um, um, what you're connected to. So having done that, I now know whose boy I am. Um, and um, as far as art's concerned, a lot of things influence me. Um, I think there's only one living artist that overwhelms me, and that's Lucian Freud, because I think he's the only artist who can stand up to the past. I was looking at this catalog, and it had a great statement in here, because drawing is really it for me, it says, and it's by Van Gogh. It says, what is it to draw? How do we do it? It's an act of clearing a path for oneself through an invisible iron wall. So I guess that's about it.